Okay guys, in this video, the lovely team is going to be talking to you about earlier and later attachment for your psychology studies. Now to help you remember all the studies, all the examples, all the cases in this video, over on my website there are loads of multiple choice questions just waiting for you. already seen in this unit how our attachments formed or not formed at a very early age of days, months or weeks can have a very profound and very lasting effect on how we develop later. And that can be how we develop physically, how we develop socially or even how we develop emotionally. And this happens in childhood but also our adulthood development. In an effort to explain and understand this, psychologists arrived at the internal working model. This had been first proposed by Bowlby, who we've seen quite a lot in this unit, who presented the following theory in three parts. The first part was this. The interactions that the child has with their primary caregiver, which remember is usually their biological mother, at an early stage, caused them to build an internal working model, an internal expectation of how attachments and interactions should be, what they should expect from these attachments and interactions. The second part is this. If the child forms an early, secure attachment, then this becomes their model or template for the future, and their future attachments and future social relationships are likely to be healthy and normal. And thirdly, if the child forms an insecure attachment, or lacks any early attachment at all, as we've seen through privation, then their future relationships and attachments will also be insecure, abnormal, or damaged they will go on to form these insecure relationships that they formed at an early age with others at a later stage in their life. To look in a lot more detail at this internal working model and whether it's true and what effects it has, a piece of research was done by Hazen and Shaver in 1987. This research was done using a questionnaire, which is actually quite an unusual way to do research in psychology. But this means it wasn't under laboratory conditions. The participants weren't filling out the questionnaire, sat in a lab. They were doing it at home. So in many ways, this meant that this research was done in the field. Participants chose themselves by responding to a love quiz in a local newspaper. The quiz asked individuals about two things. Firstly, their experiences of attachment with their parents and their relationships with their parents. And then secondly, about their expectations from a romantic relationship or partnership. Hazan and Shaver analysed the first 620 responses they found, a large sample size, and certainly much, much larger than sample sizes we're used to seeing in psychology. They found a correlation. This correlation was found between types of early attachment and later expectations of and feelings about romantic relationships and partnerships. They found that children who had formed secure attachments in a very early stage of their life were more likely to have an expect happy, trusting and healthy relationships in their later life. Insecure avoidant children were more likely to end up being nervous or fearful of either emotional or more commonly physical intimacy. They were less able to be intimate emotionally and physically with others as a result of that insecure avoidant attachment they'd experienced earlier on. And thirdly and finally, insecure resistant children were more likely to have strong worries of abandonment and disloyalty in relationships. They became much more paranoid about people cheating on them or leaving them. They were therefore much more likely to worry about not being loved by others. There was one main central conclusion from this research, and that was that early attachments do very definitely have an impact on long-term relationship expectations in later life. Put another way, the types and number of attachments that we form as an infant and baby has a profound effect on how we interact with others in relationships in our later life, especially if those relationships are romantic. This research, therefore, did find support for the internal working model theory that Bowlby had initially proposed all those years before. However, unfortunately, this, really, this research relied completely on people remembering their childhood accurately. Most of us have little ability to remember our childhood, especially our early childhood before about the age of three. For most of us, it's just vague images and half-remembered facts. Most people tend to have, because of that, an either overly positive and good feeling about their childhood or an overly negative feeling about their childhood, which colours their, rec their recollections either positively or negatively. This is likely to have influenced the results, although because everybody would be either overly positive or overly negative, it may have actually not influenced the overall trend. The influence may actually have cancelled itself out. 
but it was still an impact and anomaly on the results. This study also relied on people being honest about their childhood and honest about their relationship expectations and behaviour. Relying on people to be honest in psychology is not always a good idea, and it's completely impossible to know how many people lied and to what extent they lied, whether they just subtly manipulated their expectations of relationships and recollections of childhood or whether they were telling outright lies. That's something which cannot be told. As we've already seen, this study did have a very large sample size. But there is a problem. That sample was all from the same area. Remember, a local newspaper was used, not one that was national. And therefore, other factors such as a specific culture or widespread poverty in the area could be influencing the results. They could be acting as an unknown third factor, something which tends to happen outside of a laboratory setting. This study was effectively done in the field. It wasn't as we've seen under laboratory conditions, and therefore it has a high level of ecological validity. It applies in the real world, and perhaps to an extent can be generalised. As we've seen from previous research, a major problem with using either questionnaires or interviews to try and find out about people's childhood is that people misremember or they lie. Sometimes this is completely unconscious and not deliberate. They're misremembering out of rose-tinted glasses because they think their childhood was nicer than it was. Sometimes it's a deliberate lie. Some people have a more positive image of their parents in childhood than they should do. Some people have a massively falsely high dislike of their parents in childhood. To try and get around this, the adult attachment interview was designed. And it was designed as a means of more accurately determining the link between childhood attachment and later behaviour. It was first proposed by a group of researchers led by Maine in 1985. And this interview is based on the idea that what the actual childhood was is irrelevant and what the actual childhood attachment was is irrelevant. What actually matters is what we remember, our perception. This adult attachment interview is semi-structured. By that we mean it has some predetermined questions but some of the questions vary and they're up to individual interviewers to structure in the actual interview so there's an element of variability. Participants are asked a series of questions about their childhood, their childhood attachments and their adult relationships and this adult attachment interview follows a very set process. In the first stage, the participant is asked to state five adjectives that they believe best describe their relationships with each of their parents, their mother and their father. They could say, for example, vague, absent, disrupted, far and remote, or another example would be close, near, loved, present and strong. In the second stage, the participant is then asked to explain each one of those adjectives they chose in turn. In the third, the participant is asked about times they got upset, they felt rejected, or they otherwise had a negative experience in childhood. And by that, we usually mean a negative emotional rather than a negative physical experience. The results are then classified by professionals into one of five categories, secure, dismissing, preoccupied, unresolved, and disorganized. Maine went on to show that each one of these five categories, secure, dismissing, preoccupied, unresolved and disorganized, would show a different trend in their adult relationships. Quinton, leading a group of researchers in 1984, identified what was very quickly termed a cycle of privation. This was done by directly comparing two groups of 50 women, and in that sense it was an independent groups method. The first group of 50 women had all experienced institutional care while growing up, and that could be one of several types of institutional care. It could be the care of the state, it could perhaps be a boarding school, a residential nursery, or an orphanage. The second group of 50 had all experienced a completely normal childhood with secure, normal attachments to loving parents. Quinton found that the first group, the group that had experienced a level of institutional care as children, were much more likely to have parenting difficulties in their later life. They would struggle more as parents and struggle to help their child form those secure attachments. This suggested a pattern. It suggested that privation in one generation unfortunately leads to privation in the next generation. This means that the problem of privation persists, it continues on, and it's passed down from generation to generation. There have been several suggestions for how to break the cycle of privation, and unfortunately it's an issue which is partly political and partly economic and related to poverty as well. Two of the suggestions are these. Firstly, a reform to the practices of institutional care to make it more likely that children in that type of care will form secure attachments. And secondly, better care of and engagement with those leaving institutional care.
We've already seen in previous videos how privation and its effects can be reversed. If people are taken care of as they leave institutional care, it's possible to reverse those effects. Parker and Forrest, writing in 1993, outlined a condition which they called reactive attachment disorder. This extremely unfortunate condition occurs in children who've been damaged seriously and permanently by privation. We've already seen in previous videos case studies of the devastating effects that privation can have on children, and one of those effects is reactive attachment disorder. Usually for this to happen, this privation has been severe, sustained, and over a long period of time, usually involving cruelty or the care of the state. Reactive attachment disorder has four main symptoms. The first of these is a complete inability to either give or receive any affection, almost as if that, that particular individual does not understand what affection is. Secondly, dishonesty, recurrent and inherent dishonesty, which continues on into later life. Thirdly, either very poor or more usually completely absent social relationships, a complete inability to form no, normal social relationships with others. And fourth and finally, a higher chance of being involved with crime. In many ways, this fourth final symptom is a combined effect of the other three. Dishonesty, absent social relationships and a lack of ability to give or receive affection will push an individual towards crime. Of course, taken together and combined, these four symptoms are very dangerous. They're dangerous for the individual child and their later life in adulthood, but they're also dangerous for wider society. They lead to a higher criminal rate. By being able to identify and either treat or prevent this condition, treating it if it's already there, but preventing it if it hasn't yet occurred, a great deal of harm to individual people and a great deal of harm to society can be prevented. Most of the studies and the research that we've looked at in this whole unit suggest very strongly that privation has a direct link with a range of problems in later life, such as poor social relationships with peers, very poor emotional and mental health, poor parenting, and even high crime rates and an impact on wider society. Not all studies back up this view. Freud and Dan in 1951 found evidence which contradicted this consensus. They studied a small group of children who had been orphaned during World War II. Unfortunately, they'd been raised in a deportation camp. This was extreme privation. The, the children had been effectively orphaned and then raised outside of any institution, let alone a caring one. These children had no regular or constant or consistent contact with any kind of parental figure whatsoever in any way. The only care they received at any point was from Jewish people people passing through on their way to concentration camps. The children had no op opportunity in any way to form any kind of attachment with any caring adult figure, about as large an example of privation as it is possible to get. So instead of forming bonds with adult figures, they formed bonds with each other, with their peers in this setting. Later on, after the end of the war, the children were fortunate. They were rescued, found and adopted, and they grew up normally. They had normal social skills, normal levels of intelligence and completely normal mental health and indeed healthy relationships with those around them. This case study is unusual and it's unusually positive, but it does show that privation may not always have the impact and effects on the individual or society that we assume it does. As we've seen many times in this unit, each individual child and adult and each set of circumstances produces a different outcome. Ouch. Mm, I'll be too grim.